Welcome to the service this morning here at the West Marion Baptist Church. We're going through a mini-series on Bible prophecy. Last week we looked at Bible prophecy, and we're looking at it again this morning here of the second one. And so last week we, we got a, a, per, a perspective on how the Old Testament prophets viewed the future. And the two things that they saw, they saw the sufferings of Christ that was his crucifixion, Calvary, and then they saw the glory that was to follow, that was the second coming of Christ. They did not see the gap in between. The Old Testament prophets knew nothing of the church, nothing prophesied in the Old Testament of the church, and so they did not see the church. They saw two mountain peaks. They saw the first coming of Christ, of his birth, and then they saw the second coming of Christ. And so that's all that they saw, what was revealed to them, because God did not reveal to them everything, as we learned last week. The secret things of God belong to God, and He didn't reveal everything. And the church age, the age of the church, the age of grace is what we're in right now, in this period. And if you look on your gap there in your diagram, you'll see it there in your diagram, as we see from the cross until the, the coming and back and forth from the Lord, and you'll see that there. So they didn't see the gap between his first and second coming. And so we're going to take a look at that. So, see, we, we don't look at other things, but what we look for is the coming of the Lord. That's what we're looking for. So what the church has to look for in the future is what we're going to look at today of the expectation of prophecy. So let's begin a reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 52. Now this I say, present tense, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul's about ready to reveal a divine hidden truth that's been hidden and reveal it. We shall not all sleep. Sleep is always referred to as the believer in Christ, never death. We do not die, we just go to sleep for a while. We go into, I like to call it, hibernation. Because, you see, those that are dead in Christ out there right now, they're just hibernating. There's a, one day they're coming out. It's going to be a resurrection. Okay, so they're just sleeping. But we shall all be changed. Those that are still left or are here at the rapture are going to be changed. Those that have died in Christ that are sleeping in hibernation are going to have a resurrection, and they too are going to be changed. They're going to put on incorruption, and we're going to put on immortality. And so it's a wonderful thing that's happening. And notice when we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Keep that phrase in mind because we're going to really dig into that today. You're going to learn something, I'm sure. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So let's pray. Father, thank you for today. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for prophecy. The fact that 25% of the Bible is prophecy. So we study it literally. We take it literally. And we thank you for it. And we thank you that it is the inerrant, plenary, verbal, inspired Word of God. And so we give you all praise and glory. Thank you what we can do with it and what it does for us, the benefit of it, and so forth. Now, Lord, as we go through this this morning, once again, we ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. We ask Him to give us illumination, understanding. And when we gain understanding and knowledge of the Scripture today, we'll ask Him to give us wisdom to apply that knowledge that we've gained today. Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit now to be our teacher and our guide as He will guide us into all truth. We ask that He would bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us this week. We ask that He would anoint the Word of God in this hour. We ask that You would anoint Your servant in this hour that we may stand in the power and the anointing and the authority of the Holy Spirit of God. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. And Lord, if there's one today that doesn't know Jesus, by whether television, radio, internet, YouTube, Father, uh, Facebook, Rumble, we pray today they would come to know Christ. And know Him, to know Him is to know life everlasting. 
And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And if there's one in our service today that's never come to Jesus, oh, would today be the day that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And, Father, we'll praise you for it and give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. And praise the Lord. So we read a little bit about what we looked at last week. So this morning we're going to be looking at the promise of a pre-tribulation rapture. Are you all familiar with the rapture? Does everybody know what the rapture means? But we believe here at our church, we hold the position of a pre-trib rapture of the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, before the tribulation. And I want to show you that in the Scripture. Not what the preacher says, but thus saith the Lord, what the Word of God says, that we have a promise from the Word of God of a pre-tribulation rapture. And I feel for all of you that don't believe in the rapture, my heart goes out to you. Maybe through this series, you'll come to believe in it. If not, you're going to miss out on the greatest event in the history of the world that has ever taken place. It's when I'm gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And that could happen today. So you better keep your eye on me. And keep your ear tuned in to the Word of God. Because I just might disappear. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So now just in case if I do. The main thing is, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't put it off. Don't hesitate. Do it right now if I'm gone. Come on church, you got to help me out here a little bit. All right, the promise of a pre-trib rapture. And that is, you see, we don't focus on other things or other people. We focus on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so I want you to see this promise of a pre-trib. First of all, it is a focused promise. It is a focused promise. The church says, look for the coming of the Lord. The church says, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus, in Revelation 22. The world and everybody else will tell you that you're to look forward to this. When do we ever find the Bible telling us as believers to look for the Antichrist? It doesn't. When does it tell us to look for this and to look for that and all of this stuff that's going on? No, the church is commanded and exhorted to look for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to focus on. Because we have a focused promise that he's coming. And so uh, you need to keep that thought in mind. Revelation 20, 20. If you go back to Revelation chapter 22 and 20, we have that. If we go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. We go to Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, verse 12, verse 21. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Surely, I come quickly. Notice he uses the personal pronoun, I. We are to focus on the coming of the Lord. Get your focus upward and vertically and quit looking horizontally because all of this horizontally of people and things and everything is going to be gone and it's going to disappear and we're going to disappear and it's not going to be left around and by the way it's all going to be burned up in a tribulation so don't focus on it and don't put your stock in it and your interest in it because we're not going to be here we're kingdoms we're kids of the kingdom And the king is coming. And he's coming for you and I. And so we praise God. So we need to have a focused promise. I want you to notice something else about it. It's a sure promise. It's a sure promise. Are you with me? Okay, we're looking at a focused promise. We're looking at the promise of a pre-tribulation rapture. I want you to know we need to focus on that promise, and that is the person of Christ. I want you to notice it's a sure promise. Now go through the verses. Let the Word of God speak to you today. Get your highlighter out. Get your pen out. All right, Titus 2, 3. What's the first word? What? What's the first word? That's an action verb. We're to be doing something. We're not to be looking for the Antichrist. We're not to be looking for this or for that or anybody else. We're to be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. It's a blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is Paul writing to our young Titus, a preacher boy. And he's telling him, you start looking for the coming of the Lord. 
Why? Because it's a sure promise. And the focus of the promise is not on everything else or everybody else, church. The focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we're to focus. Look at Philippians 3.20. The apostle says, for our conversation, well, now conversation is our manner of living, our lifestyle, our living. Look at this. For our living, our conversation is in, what tense is that? Present tense. You're already a kingdom kid. See, positionally, you're already in heaven. From whence we also do what, church? Look. Say, look. Oh, very good. For the Savior. Who are we looking for? Are we looking for the judgment? Are we looking for the Antichrist? Are we looking for, the, for this? Are we looking for the governments? Are we looking for all the stuff that's going on? No. Our focus is to be looking for what? Here again, for the Savior. Well, who's the Savior? Okay, see, if somebody asks, well, who's the Savior? Well, let the Scripture tell you. It is the, notice, it's not Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord speaks of His deity, that He is God. Jesus, that He is the Messiah, that's His earthly name. And Christ is not His last name. It's not even His name. It's a title. That He is the anointed Son of the living God. That's His title. So, wow, this is fantastic. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Can somebody say, that were my sins? And unto them, that's those he was offered for, that what? Look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, that could be in reference there to the second coming of Christ, but we're talking about the rapture. 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. What? When the chief shepherd shall appear. Who's the chief shepherd? John 10 makes it very clear that Jesus is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they know my voice and they follow me. And I'm the good shepherd. And so when he shall appear, we're going to receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So we see in this promise of a pre-trib rapture, first of all, it's a focused promise. Who are we focusing on, church? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sure promise. Read you four or five verses there to help you out a little bit. And if you want to put there, put some cross reference Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, 12, and 21. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12. And then John closes out the book of the Revelation and says, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He, and, but before he says that, Jesus said, Surely I come. Now, how do we know he's coming at the rapture? The Bible says he's coming as a thief in the night. He's coming in an hour such as you think not, so cometh the Son of Man, right? The Bible says he's coming as evening as flashes from the east to the west. All right? And it's interesting when we take a look at that, and we talk about surely I come quickly. And the word quickly there in the Greek means I'm coming suddenly, by surprise, and without delay. This is the word of God, church. Not all these gurus that are out here misleading you. Man, every prophecy preacher and teacher is out there on the radio and television right now uh, was spilling their books and their tapes and getting you to buy everything. You go, oh, my goodness. You'd better, you come here, you're going to hear the word of God. You come here, it's going to be straight out of the Bible. Though if you have any argument or anything, take it up with God in his book, not with me. He wrote it, I quote it. He scripted it, and I recite it. There you go, Amen. All right, I want you to know not only is it going to be a sure promise, it's going to be a securing promise. A securing promise. Now, folks, this is out of the Word of God. Now, listen to John 14, 1 through 3. You all know it. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Now, this is the night of of his betrayal. He's at the Lord's Supper. He's about to be betrayed by Judas. And he tells them, let not your heart, men, be stirred up. Don't let it be agitated. Why? For in my Father's house are many mansions, additional dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
Then he said, I go. Now, you're going to get a good picture of this in a minute. We're not there yet. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come. Notice how many times he uses the personal pronoun I. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. That's a secure promise from Jesus himself. I'm coming for you and I'm taking you with me so you can be with me forever. Doesn't get any more than, better than that. I mean, what a promise from God. And again, that's the rapture of the church. Hello. Hello. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread, I'm so glad he put this in the Lord's Supper, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, what's the next three words? Till he come. So we've seen we have a focused promise. It's a sure promise. It's a securing promise. And now I want you to go to your chart, and we'll come back to the third in just a minute, a moment from now. All right, are you with me? Or the second there. How many of you have the chart where it says Jesus' marriage, Jewish marriage, and the marriage of the Lamb to his bride. Let's take a look now. This whole thing of the rapture of the church. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place. He's the groom. Come on, talk to me. The church is the bride. He's going to go away for a while. And he's coming back to get the bride. And he's taking us back home to the Father. Are, are you all with me? All right. Here's a picture of it in a Jewish wedding. All right, I'll try to explain it to you. The purchase of the bride. The groom negotiates for the bride. Okay? And what he does is he has to strike a contract of marriage, and he pays a dowry. It's a down payment that he pays. Once that dowry is paid and the contract is done, then it is sealed, the contract is sealed with a wine and a piece of food. That's how you do that. And that is a legal marriage. It's not a betrothal. They're not engaged. It's a legal marriage. So you got it? The Jewish groom, he goes to the father of the bride, makes an agreement, pays the dowry, the payment for her, and then it's sealed and it's a done deal. The steps in Christ securing his bride. Are you with me? There's the purchase of his bride. Jesus came to get a bride. In Luke 19.10 it says, He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he was coming on behalf of the Father, the groom, to get a bride. Are you with me? Jesus purchased the bride. Hello? 1 Peter 1.18 and 19. For we have not been purchased with gold and silver and precious stones, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the payment to the Father for his bride. And we were married to the groom. Hello? And then Jesus sealed the contract in Ephesians. For we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. What a beautiful picture. And then he left us the Lord's Supper to remember these things. All right, the betrothal period of the steps in a Jewish wedding. The bride and the groom are separated. For he goes to prepare a place to live at his father's property. Are y'all getting this? Separated from the Savior. Jesus goes to prepare a place for us. We're the bride. He's purchased us. He's gone back to the Father's house and to prepare a place for us to live. Isn't that what we just read in Matthew, uh, John 14, 1 through 3? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, so there's this separation time. The church right now is separated unto Christ and we are waiting, just like the Jewish bride, and we're waiting for the groom to come and get us. 
I turn to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look up some words here. 2 Corinthians real quickly if we're there. All right, 2 Corinthians 11. If you're right there, go to 2 Corinthians 11 with me. Everybody's first in Corinthians 11? All right. Let's watch this. Separated from the Savior, for the time being, our groom, we're the bride. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you. Hello. The church is espoused to one husband. Jesus said, I'm the groom, I'm the husband. All right, are you with me? And I may present you, notice what he's going to do. I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But, uh, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. So we have been espoused to the Savior. Are you with me? Okay? But there's a separation time. And we're waiting for the groom. All right? Now we come to the fetching of the bride. In a Jewish wedding, let's look at it first. The father tells the son when he can fetch the bride. Look across the page, Jesus fetching his church, his body, the bride. The father tells Jesus to get his bride. Next one. The bridegroom goes to get his bride. Are you with me? Now, in a Jewish wedding, when the bridegroom is told by the papa... It's time to go get your bride, son. He comes out. Oh, there's a fanfare going on, man. There's a parade. I mean, and there's noise and everything. And he's coming down the street of the city, the village, and he's making his way uh, uh, to the house uh, where the bride has been preparing and waiting for him, the bridegroom's, uh, the bride's chamber there. But the, the groom never goes to the house. Are you with me? He approaches the house. The bride comes out of the house to meet the groom. Jesus at the rapture is coming for his bride. He's not coming to the earth. He's coming in the air. And the church, the bride, is going to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. Y'all getting this? Hope you're learning something today. The rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, you know that. It's going to be the blowing uh, of the trumpet. And then there's the judgment that follows. Look at the ceremony, fetching the bride. There's a ceremony of the marriage under canopy. And, and the father of the bride proves her purity. When she's brought back to the father, he testifies of her purity. All right? Well, guess what? When there's the blowing of the trumpet and the groom comes for the bride, where are we going? We're going to the Bema seat. Come on now. The judgment seat of Christ to be testified of our purity for our works, not our sin. See the picture of this? This is so beautiful, man. Don't don't miss this, okay? I hope you don't. Okay? You can find that in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 8 through 10. All right, the father testifies. We're going to, Jesus is going to testify. Then the couple goes into seclusion for a private supper. Guess where we're going? Look across the page. We're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb after we've had the testing, the proving. Okay, <laughs> turn to Revelation chapter 19 with me. I right, don't want to miss some of the scripture passages here. All right, everybody, 19.7. All right. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife, that is the bride, the church, we're already married, hath made herself ready. Well, how did we? And to her, the church, the bride, was granted that she also should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's you and I. That's your wedding garment. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings 
of God. Verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. That's speaking of the second coming. The bride, our groom, is not coming to make war with his bride. He's coming to make war with the Antichrist. Now, if that's the truth, if that's the case, then how did we get up there to start with if we're coming with him? We got raptured out. Revelation 4.1, come up hither. And we were raptured out, and Jesus now, he's already come for his bride. Now he's coming with his bride. Oh, this is, this is just, just awesome. All right, so we're going to the marriage supper. I believe that's going to take place uh, in heaven with those of us that know the Lord. Okay, then there's after that, there's a marriage feast. Are you with me? Coming out of seclusion now, the husband presents his bride to the guest. Now, where have we gone in heaven? We've gone into seclusion in glory with our groom, and we've had a wonderful supper. Amen? All right. Now we're coming out of seclusion. The husband presents his bride to the guest. Jesus, on what is called the day of Christ will show the world his bride at the second coming. Are you with me on this? You see, we've gone into seclusion for seven years called the tribulation at the marriage supper. And now it's time, that we're not talking about the day of the Lord, we're talking about the day of Christ. And what did the groom do in the Jewish after that? He comes out and he presents his bride to all the guests. Well, Jesus is going to present his bride, the church, to all the world. Because the Bible says in verse 14 of chapter 19, we are an army coming back with the Lord. You're in the army now. Amen? And the scripture tells us over in Revelation, if you read, that when that time comes of the second coming, the Bible says that God is going to roll back the scrolls of heaven and open up heaven. And the Bible says that every eye on the planet shall see him coming in glory. And heaven's going to open up and the planet is going to look up and have God's going to open up and they're going to see the glory and the brightness of Christ, our groom, that's going to out... And that's why when the Revelation says, and the sun became dark as sackcloth, sackcloth as ashes. It's not from nuclear holocaust that everybody thinks. When the sun in his glory eclipses the sun as you in, it becomes a black dot. And here comes the glory of God with his bride, the groom, with his bride, the church. And he's to make war with the Antichrist and all the Christ rejectors and all the demons and all the armies that have gathered in the valley there, Jehoshaphat. And it'll all be over with in a short period of time. You've got to separate the two. There are two different events separated by two different things over a period of seven years. But we have this wonderful, glorious promise of a pre-tribulation rapture. It is a focused promise on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a sure promise. It is a secure promise. Okay, are, are you with me on this? Now the marriage feast. And then there's the marriage celebration of the feast. On the bottom of your little chart there. You all got it there, the marriage feast? Now this is a, what we call today a wedding reception. All right, have you all been to some of these receptions? You ever been to a poor man's reception? You know, you might have some Vienna sausages wrapped up in little, you know, <laughs> you know some little Swedish meatballs, you know, and some crackers, and, and there's your reception. And then you go to some others, and man, they're big. Then you go to some that got wealth. Come on, I hope you know where I'm going. And that reception in Jewish time, believe it or not, depended on the wealth of the parents that were involved, as to how wealthy they were, it was to how long the reception lasted. Are you all getting this? I know you're sitting there, some of you are looking at me going, 
This isn't a comic book or Marvel mystery book. This is the Word of God. A lot of prayer and work's gone into this for what you have in your head. And a lot of prayer and begging God to make it right, make it Bible, so you would enjoy it and then have it. So Jesus, that's called the day of Christ. He's going to show his bride off. Then there's the marriage celebration feast. And you know what that is? Our wedding feast is? It's called the millennial reign of Christ. We're going on a honeymoon for a thousand years with Jesus. You know why? Because the church, we're married into money. Hello. Hello. David, I don't have to wait for here on planet. My granddaughter's getting married next month, and there'll be some type of re- re- reception that'll last a few hours, and because of the wealth of the parents, that's about all it's going to be able to afford. But I'm telling you, we, as the bride, are going to enjoy our thousand-year honeymoon with Jesus because guess what? All of our lives, we've waited to be married in the money, and I'm married in the money. You all got this. My father's rich. He owns all the world. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold and the silver and the mine and the mines and the platinum and uranium and plutonium. He owns it all. And it's all Jesus and he's the heir and I'm a joint heir with Christ. So it's all mine. This, by the way, we're talking about the thousand millennial reign of Christ, right? Amen. Are y'all with me? This is a promise, here's Bible prophecy, that God made to Abraham, that God made to David, that the king, Yeshua, Messiah, would sit on his father's throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. This will be the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, to, to David, King David, B. Because we're looking at a sure promise. We're looking at A was a focused promise. Now I want you to see it's a factual promise. It's a factual promise. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. Look with me in verse 13. Uh, verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. You all got there in that spot? But I would not have you to be ignorant. We're not supposed to be ignorant, Paul said. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that's our brothers and sisters that have died in the Lord already, that you sorrow not, even as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Well, wait a minute, if they're asleep in the ground out here, how's God going to bring them? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the soul and the spirit. God's bringing the soul and spirit back with Him. Okay, are you with me this? And then notice what's going to happen. For this we say, that you by the, notice, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verse 16. For the Lord Himself, this is a fact, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Notice the first thing, the Lord Himself. The second thing with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Do what? Nothing about earth here, folks. We're caught up. The groom's coming and the bride's going up to meet the groom. We shall be caught up, snatched out, yanked out by force. The Greek word is the, the, rapturo is the rapier word for caught up, snatched out. The Greek word is harpezo. All right, so we're going to be rapturio. We're going to be harpezo up together. That's the dead in Christ with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, not on the earth. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All right? How many is on your second chart? Six facts about 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 here. All right? Let's go through them. Six facts. Number one in verse 16. The Lord will come. That's a fact. Okay? Well, that's a fact. We have the inerrant word of God telling us so. For himself. The Lord himself. 
Again, Revelation 1.7 speaks of the second coming. That is, that behold, I come uh, in the clouds. Okay, but we get to chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 7, verse 12, verse 21. You can write those down next to it as cross-references, that he himself is coming. All right? Not Revelation 19.11. That speaks of the second coming. And in Revelation 19, 8, 11, and 14, you can go back and look at that. It talks about the raid and white clothing and raiment and the armies and all that stuff. That's the second coming. All right, so the first fact of Thessalonians, the Lord himself is coming. The second fact, we will hear the Lord shout, a voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. Are you with me? Now, I want you to get this. The trumpet is very important. We're going to look at it from a Jewish standpoint. We'll look at it from a Gentile standpoint, especially the Romans. Okay? During Jesus' time period. Jewish time and the trumpets is called the Feast of Trumpets. When we celebrate, they celebrate this coming September, the Feast of Trumpets. Are you with me? That's Rosh Hashanah. Or Rosh Hashanah. All right? It's the Feast of Trumpets. There were three trumpets that they used in the Feast of Trumpets. There was a first trumpet. I don't even know if try to name the Hebrew names of them that did something. There was a second trumpet that did something. There was a third trumpet that did something. And then when the feast was over at the end of the feast, the last day, the last time of that of the feast, there would be a long, long blast of the trumpet, which was the last trumpet. Come on, get with me here. It meant victory. Okay? And that was done by the shofar. Big, long... The Old Testament days, they used a silver trumpet. The first trumpet was to arouse the people. Get up, get up. Come, assemble. The second trumpet was a second blow, a blast, two blasts. They were to march and to go. We come to the Romans. Interesting. The Romans did three trumpets. During Romans Day, those of you who have served in the military, you know what I'm talking about. The first blast of the trumpet was reveille. Time to get up and wake up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. How many of you all familiar with that? Come on, you guys that served in the military, you know what I'm talking about reveille. There was a trumpet. Then there was a second trumpet that they used in the military. And that was to assemble the troops together. Then there was a third blast on a trumpet, and that was for the troops to move out. There's going to be a last long blast at the Feast of Trumpets that's a sound of a picture of victory. And in here we read at the last trump, at the last trump of God, these things, the rapture is going to happen and take place. And we're not moving out we're moving up. And that, friends, is victory. And we're going to have our victory. And by the way, Feast of Trumpets is coming up pretty soon. And everybody right now is talking about a lot of things that are going to fall into place and that they're going to do and pull off come next September the 24th, 2024. There just might be one more last blast of the feasts of trumpets, and it's victory time for the church, for the bride. This is fantastic. So I hope you get all this. The dead in Christ will rise first. Now notice when this is going to take place. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It's in your notes there. When and how is this going to take place? In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, at the, there it is. There's the long blast at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, the twinkling of an eye, you can't see it with the naked eye. You can see a wink or a blink, but General Electric 30 years ago, now it's probably even faster because of the technology we have today, measured the twinkle, twinkle of a human eye 11th one hundredth of a second. That's to the 11th power, 11 zeros. I mean, you've you got to be kidding me. But even better than that, it says in a moment. You know what a moment is? It's the Greek word uh, translated 
autonomous, or where we get our English word, Adam. Come on, get a hold of this, man. Don't miss this. You, you got this? The Adam is the smallest part of matter. Okay? It's invisible, and it cannot be divided by time. In a moment, I'm out of here. Fourthly there, the fourth fact, the Christians will be caught up, right? The Lord's coming down, and we're going up to meet Him in the air. Pre-tribulation. Now let me show you the difference between that and what's in the verses I gave you, because in the, cha- the Christians shall be caught up. All right, I want you to read with me Revelation chapter 6, 12 through 17. I want to show you the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. They're totally different. We're going up in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And in Adam's time, it can't be divided. It's so quick. Okay? Or you got that. And we're going to meet him in the air. That is, the bride meets the groom in the air. When the second coming, we find Revelation 6, 12 through 17. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, because the moon reflects the sun, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her timely figs. See, you don't read any of that in the rapture of the church. Total different event, when she shall be shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Remember what I told you a while ago? And when it, when a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place, that don't sound like rapture to me. And the kings of the earth, that don't sound like rapture to me. And the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's the second coming of Christ. That is not, it's totally different than the rapture. For the great day, notice, not the day day of the Lord, not the great day of Christ, but the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? No one. This is a description of the second coming of Christ. Totally different and separate from the rapture of the church. Fifthly, we will meet the Lord where? In the air. Second coming, He's going to land on the Mount of Olives where He left from. His feet shall touch the Mount of Olives and it'll, the cleave in a two running east and west. You got that? Oh, this is fantastic. You see, Revelation 6 through 19, 11, all this goes hand in hand. And the first half of that, they're all parallel with each other. It all runs parallel. All right, number six, we will ever be with the Lord. Verse 17, this, this is coming off of 1 Thessalonians. So six facts. The Lord will come himself. Uh, we're going to hear the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead are going to rise first. Christians are going to be caught up. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be with the Lord forever. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Now, see, now that's the difference between that and the second coming of Christ. Don't confuse the two. You can't. And all these people that are trying to allegorically this, that's the problem. They want to confuse the two or mix the two, and you can't mix the two. They are totally separated, distinct, different events and different times, separated by a seven-year period called the tribulation. We are not in the process of the second horseman right now. One guru out there says we're we're beginning to see the second horseman of the four apocalypse, of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. No, we're not. Okay? Christ is not sitting on, he's sitting on the throne, yes. But he's not ruling this kingdom because he's not here with the kingdom yet. And that we're already in the millennium. No, we're not. Some of them don't even believe in the millennium. They take it allegorically. It's, it's spiritualized it to be whatever they want it to be. That's that Christ sitting on the throne and all this going on, folks. Oh, praise God. You're getting the Bible today, I hope. All right, I got to hurry. Let's look at the last thing here. The perspective of the rapture. We looked at the promise of a pre-trib rapture. I believe the Scripture's done that for us. Now we're going to take a look at the perspective. First of all, it is seen as an imminent event. 
The rapture is seen as an imminent event. I'm sorry for those that don't believe in the doctrine of imminency. There is a doctrine of imminency. All right? And that is, first of all, notice with me, at any moment, that's that atom, the twinkling of an eye. Nothing has to happen for this event. The doctrine of imminence is here already. Now, the reason is because the church is not appointed to wrath. Y'all got that? This is the reason for the perspective of the rapture that it's an imminent return event. We are not appointed to wrath. Listen to what 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have attained salvation today? Come on, can I get some amens, hallelujah, what? How many of you have obtained salvation? If you have obtained salvation, then you are not appointed to wrath, and the tribulation is the wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 And we're to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. If you've gotten saved, born again, you have been delivered from the wrath that is to come through salvation in Christ. Jesus is coming to look to fetch His bride. He's not coming to make war with His bride. Difference. Okay, you got that. Revelation 3.10. You, know how, you can write it down there for a reference for you. It's a letter to the church of Philadelphia. And in that letter, Jesus said, because of their testimony and all that they've done, Jesus said, I will keep you from, not preserve you through. Come on, talk to me. Okay, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. That's a promise to the church of Philadelphia. I will keep you from. The word keep in the Greek is the word ek, E-K, ek. And it means out of of not preserved through Jesus said I will keep you out of the tribulation hour that's a promise to the church from our groom to his bride hallelujah John Wolver great Bible scholar theologian prophecy teacher passed on gone home to the Lord already while scripture presents many signs of Christ's second coming and the establishment of his kingdom there are no predicted events preceding the rapture. It could happen at any time. Second truth, the perspective of the rapture. Not only is it uh, imminent, but the church is absent in the book of Revelation. In chapter 6 through 18 and all the way up to 1911, I believe. There is no mention of the church. Nothing. The last you hear of the church is in chapter 5 of Revelation. Chapter 4, John gets raptured up, come up hither, and he sees the saints sitting on thrones of glory with their Stephanos crowns on that they've earned at the judgment seat of Christ. And he says then in verse 11 of chapter 4, we're going to a coronation day, and the saints are casting their crowns at Jesus' feet, and we are crowning him the King of kings and the Lord of lords and singing a song, for he is worthy of all honor and glory and praise be unto him. That that's what we're doing. We're not there. And from now, don't you think if, if John, uh, under the Holy Spirit, if, if the church had anything to do with this, he certainly would have mentioned it and talked about it. But you don't find the word ecclesia, you don't find that word called out, the called out body, the church. It's not mentioned because, church, we're not there. We're not there. We don't pop up again <laughs> until we come riding back on white horses as the armies of heaven. In verse 14, well, how did the army get there? Any way to get any army moved anywhere, it's called mobilization. You got to move them. You got to mobilize them. And in chapter 4, John got mobilized. He got caught up. And the church is going to get caught up. We're going to get mobilized. And we're going to have seven years of training for a war that we won't even have to fight. The Bible says the sword will go out of his mouth and he will smite the nations. And it'll all be over. Wow. 
So the perspective of the rapture, it's an imminent event, and the church is absent. The church is not mentioned. The seven-year tribulation is going on at this time. Wrath is being poured out. This is what the body of Christ says in Galatians. This is really cool. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ. How many have been baptized into Christ? Have put on Christ, as if you've gotten saved. Now notice, this is how God, if you want to know how God reviews uh, this how God reviews the earth right now and everything, how he reviews it. He reviews it. There's only three groups of people on the planet right now, right now. This is how he views it. For there's neither Jew, first group, second group, Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male or female. For ye are all one in Christ. We're all one. This is the body of Christ. Speaking of the body of Christ. So how does God break all this down in this present age that we live in? How does God see this present age? Because in glory, we're all going to be one. Okay? Not going to be any difference between the Jew, the Gentile, and the... Okay, let's see how he does it. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, first group, nor to the Gentiles, second group, nor to the church of God, third group. Three groups of people on the planet today. Are you with me? The first two groups that are mentioned, Jews and Gentiles, the majority of them are lost. Then he mentions the church of God, that's the saved. You see, there's three groups, but there's only two kinds of people. You're either saved or you're lost, period. There's no in-between. Does everybody got and understand what I've tried to present to you today? through the Bible, the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit. You haven't heard a preacher. The Bible says, To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You've heard from the Holy Spirit, not from me. Okay? Jesus said, If you have an ear, listen. Listen up. With all of this information that we got today, we got a lot of information. How do we respond to the rapture of this coming event that we don't know when it's going to happen. How do we respond to it? Well, how should we live then in light of this? Well, first of all, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. How do we respond to all this, church? And to you that are watching and listening, if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. You understand what I'm saying? Right now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now, present tense, don't delay it. Now is the time to be born again. Because the rapture could take place right now. So if you're not saved and you don't know the Lord, and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you've never confessed and repented of your sins and asked Christ to come into your life to save you and to change you and take you to heaven, to be born again by the Spirit of God from above and experience the new birth. May I highly recommend you do it and do it right now. Don't even wait for me to finish the invitation. This is an invitation, by the way. Because it could happen right now, the rapture. So you need to get saved right now. Don't even put it off. Say it in your own words. Just say, dear God, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. Forgive me. I receive Christ and his atonement on the cross. Save my sin sick soul. Be merciful to me, God, a sinner. And Christ will save you. And if the trumpet sounds right now, we'll meet you in the air on the way up. But if you don't, you're going to be left behind to go through the wrath of God and have nothing but hell to look forward to. Now people say, oh, there he goes again on that hell thing. What did we learn in Sunday school this morning? We are to persuade men knowing the terror of the Lord. Hello? Now, only those who are saved are going at the rapture. All others will be left behind to go through the judgment, the wrath of God, and nothing but hell to look forward to. Unless by some grace and miracle... You get saved by the witness of the 144,000 Jewish men that will be evangelizing and by the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And they're going to be preaching to Israel in Jerusalem. And they're going to be telling Israel that get ready, Messiah's coming. 
Get ready, your Messiah is coming. And they'll be witnessing. Someone says, well, why the 144,000 Jewish men to go witnessing? Because the church is not there. Our job is to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. Our job is to go and witness and proclamate the gospel of Christ. That's what he's called us to do. That's why they're doing it. We're not there. And then there's one lucky angel, man. I don't know who it is, but he's, going to get, he's, he's the lucky one. He's going to get to fly around in the sky preaching the gospel to the inhabitants of the earth. I wonder who God's got lined up. Gabriel's always been the messenger. So it may be him. Michael the archangel. He's the defender of Israel. Don't mess with Israel. You've got to mess with Michael. All right? So, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, I'll read it for you. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now what about, what about us that are saved, those of us who are saved? All right, 1 Corinthians 15.34 says here, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. That's why we're to awaken up because there's lots that don't have the knowledge of God because they're depending on us to tell them. So we are to witness. We're to reach the lost. And Paul says, I speak to this to your shame. He says, wake up and arise because there's a lot that don't have the knowledge of God. That's what we're to be doing. What have we been doing in light of this imminent return? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 Tells us we're not to forsake this something of ourselves together. Tells us we're to provoke one another. First of all, he says in verse 24, consider one another. Then he says, provoke one another unto love. Then he says, provoke one another to do good works. Then in verse 25, he says, forsaking not the church, of going to church and being in church. Then he says, exhorting one another. And we're to do it so much as we see the day approaching. That's what we're to be doing in light of the rapture. Is gathering and meeting here to be exhorted, to be admonished, to be motivated, to be encouraged, to go out and to reach the lost because of the imminent rapture of the church that could take place at any moment. Reaching the lost, taking as many as we can. If you've never been saved and born again, if you've never trusted Christ, I can't see how you can't hear about that today, from today. We tried to make it the best that we could, but God made it much better because it's His Word. I'm just His servant, His mouthpiece. Try to do what He wants me to do and beg for help all the time to interpret it right, rightly divide the Word of truth. That's why the Scripture says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, so that you can rightly divide the Word of God. And so I hope that we've done that to you today to encourage you, to excite you. Now, we get all excited about all this. I'm ready for the trumpet. I'm listening to it. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm waiting. I'm ready to go. I mean, I'm ready to go to heaven and everything else and get out of this place. Amen? But in the meantime, what about all the people that are lost, that need the Savior, need to be saved, that are lost? That's what Paul said. Arise, he says, to righteousness. Wake up. Because many do not have the knowledge of God. They don't know God. And the only way you're going to know God is through Jesus. Remember what Jesus said. If you believe in God, that's okay. You'd better believe in me also. Right? Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except by me. That's the only way you're going to get to God is through Jesus Christ. And you've got to come to Him as your Lord and Savior and receive Him personally as your Lord and Savior. Something you have to do personally. I can't do it for you. The church can't do it for you. Something you've got to do. If you've never been saved, never been born again, I encourage you to. I encourage, quit sitting in the church. Quit watching and listening and thinking you're saved. You'd better know you're saved. The devil wants nothing to do but get you to think you're saved, that you're okay, everything's all right because you do this or don't do that, or you go to the West Marion Baptist Church once a week, whatever, and he's going to think you're saved. But I'm telling you, you'd better know you have a no-so salvation. 
First John says, These things have I written unto you that you may know, know, that you may know that you have eternal life, and this life is in his Son, believing on his name. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. This record is in his Son. So if you're not saved today, you say, Why are you getting so excited and yelling and hollering? Because the Paul, the, 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 we learned this morning that we are knowing the terror of the Lord, we're to persuade men. So I'm trying to persuade you to get saved today. I'm not mad at you. I'm not angry. I love you. Amen. Nothing else. I know you want to hear the word, but hey, nothing else. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm trying to keep you out of hell Amen. through a relationship with Christ. Amen. I don't want to hear about hell. Well, you'd better hear about it because that's where you're going to spend eternity without the Lord. Somebody said, well, I don't want to push anybody. Where are you going to push them to? Hell number one, hell number two, hell number three. Where are you going to push them? You're supposed to compel them. Go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. The word compel means by force. It means you literally have to grab them by the arm and yank them to church with you. Why? Because of their destiny is at stake. And where they'll spend in eternity. So we study prophecy to motivate us, to excite us, to challenge us, to learn. And what did we learn this morning in Sunday school that prophecy can do for us? Huh? We can turn our prophecy into what? Praise. We can turn our prophecy into prayer. We can turn our prophecy into purity. And we can turn our prophecy into proclamation. And that's what we're doing. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Miss Cindy, go ahead. You've never met Jesus. You're watching by television, Rumble right now, Facebook, YouTube, radio, whatever. Whatever means we have available to give to you. And you're listening. And you've never been saved. You've never truly but come to Christ and received Him as your Lord and Savior. We want to give you an opportunity to do so right now. With just a few minutes I have left. I hope we're still on the air, but we'll make it so we can get it to you. Friend, I want you to get saved. You need to be saved, and you need to do it right now. Boast not thyself for tomorrow, for one knows not what tomorrow may bring. Life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it's vanished away, James says. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is accepted time. So would you pray with me, if you're here in the auditorium as well, not just the television audience out there, radio, internet. Pray with me. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me. And I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. And so right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or at that rapture thing the preacher's talking about. I just want to make sure that I'm in Christ. So I I thank you, dear Lord, for answering my prayer right now and giving to me eternal life everlasting life and a home in heaven and I thank you dear Christ now help me to live for you till Jesus comes and I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you thanks for praying with us and we trust many of you out there in the media world and the media have received Christ today Write us, call us, email us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to send you a little pamphlet. Now that you're saved, what next? Absolutely free. We'll send you this message, DVD format, if you want to watch it on TV or screen or audio, listen to it in your car, whatever. Absolutely free. Or any other messages we have, you just call us and write us. But most of all, we want to hear you got saved and trusted Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you till we meet again, and we'll look forward to meeting with you. Uh, next week as we continue our series in prophecy. God bless you. 
Thanks for tuning in with us tonight. And thank you for being saved tonight, today, this morning. Those of you that prayed with us. Till we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.